with possibly the most aviation airs I've ever seen in 60 minutes, part two, Criminal Minds. Something's overriding our commands. Coming up. Hey, 7-4 crew, welcome back. If you don't know me, my name's Kelsey. I'm a 747 pilot. My channel, 7-4 here, is all about aviation. I've never actually had to do a part two of any Hollywood versus reality or TV versus reality on any breakdown I've ever done. But there were so many errors in the part one of this, I had to break it into two separate videos. Now, if you haven't seen the first part, I'll put a link to it in the description as well as up above my head. But let's recap. So far, what we know is a plane has crashed, the plane has a diagram of a 727, the measurements of a 747, as well as looking strangely like a narrow body on the inside. At this point, they don't know what the cause of the crash is, but they've guessed it's caused by the pilot shutting down all the systems of the plane because they were unable to send a text message, which is the equivalent of being on a hike, needing to make a phone call, not being able to get reception, and so you throw your phone off the side of the mountain when you still need to make a phone call. All right. Let's see how part two is. Let's get into it. We just reviewed the flight data recorder. The plane porpoised on and off for the last three minutes it was airborne. But there's no indication of system or mechanical malfunction. Everything was working normally. Including the autopilot? Because it sounded like they couldn't override it. Yeah. There's one theory we haven't considered. Someone other than the pilot or the co-pilot was controlling the plane. The way the plane broke up proves there was no missile. The crash was caused by something internal. But the pilot and co-pilot have been cleared, so that means someone from the ground hacked into the plane's computers. It makes sense with the data from the black box. All right, so the big question here is, can someone hack a plane from the ground and get control of it? So here is something that a computer guy told me. He said, anything that's on the internet that is transmitting any type of information, if there's any type of a connection there, if you can access it from the ground, anybody else can also access it from the ground, good or bad. So could someone hack in and get that information and be in control of some aspects of it, technically, yes. But here is my prediction of what would happen. If you were flying along as a pilot and the plane started to do something, turn left, descent, climb, do anything other than what it's supposed to be doing at that point, your pilots, every pilot is trained to disconnect the autopilot and get the plane back on course or doing what it's supposed to do. So what would happen in that scenario is the plane starts, I don't know, turning, climbing, descending, whatever it is, the pilots would disconnect the autopilot and probably reconnect that same autopilot, thinking that it must have been some malfunction. They'd reconnect that autopilot. If the plane did that same weird thing again, then they would disconnect it, get it back on course, and probably try a different autopilot. On the 747, we have three different autopilots, so they would probably try one of the other autopilots to see that, hey, there, there was a problem, maybe that one's malfunctioning, we have two more, let's go to those. When I made part one to this video, I talked about having a malfunction with the autopilot when we were in cruise. And what we ended up doing is disconnecting it, trying to rehook it up to the original autopilot, which was the right side, I believe, and then that wasn't working. So we ended up connecting it to the center. Like I said, there's three. So we hooked it up to the center autopilot, and then it was fine for the rest of the flight. So they're talking about the autopilot malfunctioning or the guy hacking it from the ground, getting control of the autopilot, and then directing the plane to do things. But if the plane was doing something that the pilots didn't want, they would just disconnect it and hand fly it. Something you learn from day one of flight school is how to hand fly a plane. The thing to remember is for the hacker to have control of the plane, he would have to have control of the autopilot. So if you disconnect the autopilot, that's the thing that's moving all the controls. With that disconnected, now the pilot is in full control of the plane. So he would have to have the autopilot on and engaged in order to be controlling the plane. If there's multiple places that you can disconnect the autopilot. So if that autopilot is disconnected, the guy that's hacking the aircraft has no control over anything that's going on. So what is the likelihood of someone hacking into a plane, getting control of it, and then them crashing the plane while the pilots stare at the plane crashing into the ground? It's pretty much zero. I mean, even your worst pilot would know. Disconnect the autopilot and get the plane level. But there is a risk, and that's what some of the people's concern are of having pilotless aircraft is that if the people on the ground who are the good guys can control that plane, there are people potentially who are bad guys that could also have control of that plane. So it's just sometimes people ask me, hey, how far are we away from pilotless aircraft? I mean, I personally have no interest in being on a plane where there's no pilots up there, but that is the real risk. If you have someone on the ground who's a good guy that control it, then you have someone on the ground who could be a bad guy who could also get control of it. We got a problem. All planes over U.S. airspace right now have responded to the order to land, except one. Which one? 
Interatlantic Air, flight number 61. It left San Diego at 1405 Zulu, scheduled to land in Washington, D.C. at 1915. There's 301 passengers on board. And there's been no communication from them? Not since the order to ground all flights was made. How long have they been out of touch? 11 minutes. We've got a problem with the radio. All I'm getting is static. We entered a new air traffic region. They probably sent us their own frequency. Running through other channels now. I am not sure why Hollywood does this so often. This is a 747 on the outside, but Hollywood has some problem matching up the outside of the plane with the inside of the plane. If you have four engines on the outside of the plane, then you at least need four levers on the inside of the plane. Something else that's very Hollywood as well is the idea that the first officer, who's the guy that's sitting up there, that he's going to be sitting up there by himself while the captain is out and she's going to the bathroom or getting coffee or whatever she's doing. In the US, it's required that there's always two crew members up there. So in this scenario that there are just two pilots, you're going to have the captain leave to go to the bathroom or get coffee or whatever she's going to do. A flight attendant or another crew member that's part of that crew will be up there. And that is for safety. I mean, the first officer could be choking. I mean, any, any variety of situations that could be going on, there's always going to be two people up there. So the scenario where the captain's walking in and the first officer's just hanging out there by himself, doesn't make any sense. The only time that doesn't apply is on cargo planes. So on R747 that are just straight cargo, there's no door there. There's no locking door. So if the captain gets up while I'm flying to go get a coffee or go to the bathroom, there's no door. So let's say he went to the bathroom and I started choking for whatever reason, he'd come out and see me there or she'd come out and see me there and I don't know, be able to save my life, I would hope, I don't know. But the situation is they're not locked out from having control of the aircraft. In this situation, there's a locking door and she's left and then somehow just magically open the door, even though there's a bunch of passengers back there, but they didn't try to get into the flight deck. It's just the captain only, uh, biometrics walked into the flight deck. Makes no sense. So in this scenario here, there'd be a flight attendant up there until the captain came back on the flight deck. And then this captain walking in like this is totally Hollywood because if she can walk in the door like that, any other passenger could. Another thing that's very Hollywood is the way she's moving her seat as well as the way she has her seat belt set up. The reason no pilots leave their shoulder harnesses on there is because they're not necessary. You're required to have them for takeoff and landing because if you were going to get into a crash, just like if you were in a car on the ground, you're going to hit something and it's going to throw you forward. Once you get up in the air, there's nothing you're going to hit. There are no uh, mid-air car crashes, despite what some people might think. So once you're up in the air, most pilots take them off. Now there's a release on the back of the seat belt. There's uh, a little piece of metal or aluminum that you can hit and what it does it just releases your shoulder harnesses. They're on a, uh, a thing that just basically shoots them back up. So you hit this button, they pull back into this reel and then they're out of the way. So that's what happens in real life and a lot of times pilots will hit that within the first 10 seconds of rotation and then they'll put their shoulder harnesses back on usually within the last couple minutes as they get ready for landing. But other than that, there's no reason to have them on. We have our seatbelts on just like every passenger should have their seatbelt on because if there's turbulence, you don't want to get thrown up, but your shoulder harnesses are more to keep you from shooting forward than they are to keep you from shooting up. Pilots on the 747 also don't access their seat like this from the outside. They actually access it from the inside. On the seats on the 747, there's these little buttons that you hit to move forward, to move it back, to move it up, to move it down. Now, can you manually do it? Yes, you can manually do it. But why would you manually do it when you can hit a little button and the little motor just moves the seat wherever you want it to go? That's what most pilots do. You will almost never see pilots doing that except maybe at the end of the flight or at the very beginning of the flight just to get it out of the way. But usually in flight, once they move that seat back, it usually comes out into the outside when they get out of their seat. And then once they get back into their seat, they will hit that button and the motor will just move them along where they want to go. I think it's also worth mentioning here from this outside, you can see that the gear is actually up, but on the inside, the gear lever handle is down. So they have some really serious problems if the gear handle is down, but the gear is actually up on the outside. Another thing that's incorrect is that when air traffic control gives you a bad frequency or you hear it wrong, both are possible, what will happen is the pilot will tune in that frequency, they'll switch over to that station, they'll make a transmission on that station. When they don't hear anything back, usually they'll make a second transmission thinking that maybe air traffic control was busy. So after they make that second transmission and nobody's there, they go back to their previous frequency. This isn't a 1990s television. So 
By tuning in the wrong frequency, you don't get static like this. We've got a problem with the radio. All I'm getting is static. So once the pilot goes back to the previous frequency, if the controller isn't there because they've gone too far away, then they would go on to guard. I've talked about it in a bunch of videos. You dial in 121.5 and they would transmit there. Every pilot in the area will hear you and air traffic control in your region will hear you. You will tell them your flight number and that you lost your previous frequency. They will find out which controller is working that area and then they'll get you handed over to the correct frequency and you're off and away. Not a big deal at all. So then when he says something like this, running through other channels now, you just have to realize this isn't a road trip that you're on with your homies and then you're just scanning for a better radio station. You can't just hit the scan button and it gets to some new better signal. That's not how it works. And then when the captain comes back from the bathroom and says this, we entered a new air traffic region. They probably sent us the wrong frequency. She would not know that they have changed sectors with inside the US unless she's possibly the most situationally aware captain I have ever seen in my life. In which case, if she is in the bathroom or getting a coffee and knows that they have changed sectors, if she knows everything to that level of precision, then she probably also knows what the frequency is for that air traffic control center which they just entered, which she doesn't. So in conclusion, this is 22 seconds of stuff that is completely wrong, including the fact that when they're on the outside of the plane, it's making a propeller noise, which they did in the comedy Airplane, which I did a Hollywood versus reality on, which was a straight comedy, but is appearing to have more things real about it than this Criminal Minds episode. All flights ordered to land at the nearest airfield, disable autopilot and maintain manual control. Repeat, disable autopilot and maintain manual control. Albuquerque Center, this is IA61, over. confirmed except for IA61. IA61, come in. Albuquerque Center, this is IA61, over. Still no response. Does anyone have them on radar? Albuquerque Center, this is IA61, over. Hollywood, for some reason, really loves the overhead panel on the, on the aircraft. There's only a few things that you're ever really going to touch up there. You're going to touch the lights when you're doing takeoff and landing, and then you're going to touch the packs for the temperature controls. You'll touch those. That's about it. And in a cruise, it wouldn't even be where she's touching, so it makes no sense at all. Yet it seems like in any show, if it's long enough, there's somebody doing something with the overhead panel. The radio calls are also something that are completely incorrect. You will never hear air traffic control make a statement, then say repeat, and then repeat that same statement again. You won't hear that, and you also won't hear something like this. Albuquerque Center, this is IA61, over. confirmed except for IA61. IA61, come in. If air traffic control has already reached all the other people, they're gonna be calling directly to that plane because they know that pilots are listening for stuff that's just to their flight number. When I'm listening to the radio and there's a bunch going on, like let's say you're in a busy place like JFK or Amsterdam, and there's a bunch of different radio traffic that's happening, you're listening for just your flight number, nothing else. If it's not your flight number, you kind of disregard it. Unless you're in a small area, like a, you're on the ground and you're listening to planes that are taking off or moving, you're kind of keeping an eye or an ear out for you know, a plane that's taking off from a runway that you're crossing or something like that. But otherwise, when you're in this section of flight, which they're on cruise, you're not gonna be really paying too much attention unless they're talking about, hey, you have a 747 that's on the same heading as you or something like that that you might be listening to. But generally speaking, they know that you're listening for your flight number. So if air traffic control has already reached everybody except this one plane, then they would be calling to that plane directly and that's how that would work. A terrible day in aviation, obviously 9-11, air traffic control was grounding all the planes, kind of like what they're suggesting here in this situation. They're grounding all the planes. But they don't just tell all the planes like, hey guys, you should all go land soon. That's not how it works. Air traffic control is directing you of places to go where you, obviously your plane can land. You're not going to take 747 and go have them land at a tiny little airport. You're going to have them go land at a big airport and they're not just going to let you pick and choose. Let's say you're in the middle between Fresno and Vegas and they say, hey, uh, we need you to go get on the ground as quickly as possible. Thanks. Well, where are you going to go? Well, you're going to go to Vegas, of course, instead of Fresno. Sorry, people from Fresno. But of the two, where would you rather be stuck for a few days? The other thing is when air traffic control calls you, they give you a second to respond. It's not like this here. IA61, come in. Albuquerque Center, this is IA61, over. Still no response. Does anyone have them on radar? So once they call you, they're going to give you some time to respond, especially since you're the only plane who hasn't responded. Everybody else is headed to the airport, right? So if they call you, they're going to give you a chance to respond. They're not just going to give you a half a second and then say they haven't responded. So this whole thing makes no sense at all.
Now, since I'm ripping this episode apart to pieces, I might as well mention that the mic placement that she has here is so far away from her mouth. There's a lot of noise that's going around on the flight deck just from the wind and things like that. So the pilots always keep the mic very close to their mouth so that their transmissions can be heard clearly. And finally, the other thing that's very Hollywood here is that pilots aren't babysitters. So this idea of asking, does anybody else have them on radar? We're not gonna know where they are. Listen to this. A61 over. Still no response. Does anyone have them on radar? I mean, who exactly is he talking to? And nobody says over. Over. It's kind of like they half paid a pilot consultant to come on at the show and the pilot started talking about A cars or something like that. And then kind of halfway through they said, okay, we don't need you anymore because they have some weird aviation, very specific aviation terms. And then they have some things that literally make no sense at all. So it's like they half paid somebody and then they just kicked them off the lot. You would think with the budget and movies that these shows had that they could pay someone to help put this thing together to have it make some sense for the viewers, to make the viewers understand what's real. I mean, I could do all kinds of things to give the exact same scenario that they wanted, but have it be in the realm of reality other than the way that they're explaining it. Makes no sense. All right, let's see what's next. I'm gonna try center on guard. One, two, one point five. This is IA-61, over. We have IA-61 on radar entering the ARTCC two minutes ago. All systems seem to be functional. IA-61, if you read Squawk 0365. The transponder code won't change. Hold on. Looks like the ACAR system just went down on IA-61. We're gonna land in Flagstaff. Go direct now. I'm trying to. Nothing's working. I don't get it. Autopilot's off. Something's overriding our commands. The landing gear is deploying. This is painful for me to watch because there are so many different airs in here and I feel like I'm just ripping this whole thing to shreds, but there are so many airs. Let's start with the thing that they did get correct here. They did contact them on guard like she said. Listen to this. I'm gonna try center on guard. One, two, one point five. This is IA-61, over. So that part is correct. You would contact guard if you weren't able to catch them on the main frequency that you were trying to call them on. You would catch them on guard. And if you couldn't get them on guard on that same radio that you're using, you would try your backup. On the 747, we have three. You would try one of the backup radios, maybe thinking your radio has failed. The thing is, you wouldn't be changing your radio in this thing right here. You could change your radio frequencies in there, you could do that, but it would make no sense because the radios are on the center pedestal, which is right to your left or your right, depending on what seat you're sitting in, it's right between everybody. So you can reach in and change the frequency there a lot easier. To change a frequency like she's doing here doesn't make any sense. And also, when we're changing frequencies or touching that box in any way, it doesn't make a cash register noise like this. One, two, one point five. This is not a kid's toy, this is a real machine. It's operated by kids, there's a difference. You also wouldn't be changing your transponder frequency in that box. There's a separate place to change that as well on the center pedestal. It's very quick and easy to change. You wouldn't be doing that in there. And in this situation where air traffic control is wondering if you can hear them, but they can't hear you because your radio is only working on one way or whatever, they'll ask you to do a squawk ident. Where you hit this button, there's a flash on the screen. So then the controllers know, hey, they can hear me up there, so I'm gonna give them instructions and I know that if they're complying with my instructions, that they're doing the thing that I want them to be doing, they just can't transmit back. So those are situations where air traffic control and the pilots are working together and it just kind of takes experience to, for the controller to think about doing that or for the pilots to do that to let them know, hey, I can hear you but you can't hear me, things like that. This is a reading light and that is not how this works. That box right there is actually backlit because at night you don't want a light up there that's shining onto your computer screen while you're trying to type in there. That does not exist. Now, I don't know how well air traffic control itself can monitor the different systems of the aircraft, but they can see if they're trying to send you a message and it's not getting through. That is possible. But the ACAR system, like I've mentioned multiple times in this breakdown, it's not that important. So it's not something that they would be very concerned about. But this was very good command authority on behalf of the captain in the way that she said that they were going to Flagstaff right here. We're gonna land in Flagstaff, go direct now. But then what do you see the first officer do? He looks up on the overhead panel. So unless she's saying, let's go to Flagstaff, and he's thinking, 
I better change the temperature in the cabin, he has no reason to be looking up there. They've been hitting everything in that box for changing the frequency and changing the squat code, but the real time that you would need it is if you're going to a different place. So the one opportunity that they had to actually be doing stuff in that box is the one time they look in the overhead panel. Like, you love that box, type in that box the one time that it actually makes sense to be typing in there, that's the time to do it. Now we already talked about the autopilot and this person on the ground controlling the autopilot, you would just hit a button. When your autopilot does disengage, there is a weird horn noise that does go off. However, we've already determined that for this hacker to get control of the plane, he needs the autopilot to be on. So in this scenario, there shouldn't be a autopilot disconnect noise, which I think is what they're trying to simulate. That's not the right noise, but let's just assume that that's what they're trying to simulate there. If that were to go off, there's a way to make it shut off. You wouldn't just be flying around with that thing blaring at you like that. But the, the guy that's on the ground that's hacking the plane needs the autopilot to be on. So that doesn't make sense. Why turn the autopilot off? You need the autopilot on. And then finally, there's this part about the landing gear. The landing gear is deploying. But the landing gear lever has been down the whole time. So I'm not sure why they're surprised when the landing gear goes down. The lever's literally been down since, I guess, takeoff? Because that's when you would bring it up. Anyways, this next part, they find the bad guy, so let's see what happens here. Put it down. Why should I? If you want glory, you've already got some. Stay back, or I'll blow the plane up. You've proven your point. You've already destroyed the plane Christina was on. There is no need to kill hundreds more. You think this is about Christina? She's nothing. She's less than a speck of dirt. What do you want? Call off the fighter jets. If we don't? So they found the bad guy and they found him with his remote. I don't know why they're using a remote like you would have for a remote control plane. You could easily just buy a yoke off of Amazon and have it shipped to your house. And that'd be way more realistic than this guy having a remote like a remote control plane. I mean, guys, really, come, you're not even trying. The 747 is a graceful plane. So you're not gonna get a fast response like this that they're showing here. There's no way that you're going to do that with or without a remote or in the plane. You're just not going to be able to move this aircraft that rapidly like they're showing. The other weird thing is they have this weird instrument display. You, This guy is smart enough to hack this plane and do everything, but then he has this not instrument display. You would just use literally the exact same instrument display that's on the plane you would just use that on your computer? I mean, if you've gone this far, you would just get that exact same display, not whatever weird made up thing that they have on here. It makes no sense. I mean, like, you know what the screen looks like, just have him have that screen in his hijacking dinner, whatever he's at. And this guy must also have a turbulence button on his remote control here, because when you go into a steep dive on a plane, it doesn't necessarily get turbulent like this. Turbulence isn't something that you need to be scared of, but I've done a lot of very steep descents, not because some hacker has hacked my plane, but I've just done it for whatever reason. And in no scenario is it gonna be turbulent like that. You will sometimes see the air brakes go up on the wings where we pull these things up and they basically slow the plane down. Now that makes the plane rumble a little bit, but that's not anything to be nervous about. It just is rumbling the plane and the pilots are using it to slow us down and get down faster. Some airports that you go to, air traffic control will want to keep you high, and then they say, okay, now we need you to get down quickly. So you will do that. Nothing to be scared of, but it does make the plane rumble because it's just the wing is designed to have it be smooth and the air to fly over smooth. And when you put these things up, it basically makes the plane rumble a bit because the air is now flowing over kind of rough and it's going over the wings, which is then shaking the plane. The thing about turbulence to realize is that flying through turbulence, these planes have been tested for just about any type of turbulent air that you will ever experience. So long story short, when you hear turbulence, don't even worry about it. You have never even seen the level of turbulence that these planes can take. You will never experience it. And it's all bumpy like that. There's nothing to worry about. Don't freak out. Okay, so they've obviously had to kill the bad guy because he was uh, quickly descending the plane and hitting the turbulence button and nobody hits the turbulence button. So they had to kill him. So let's see how this ends. This is IA-61. We just made an emergency landing. Over. Yeah! 
Pilots don't ever say over in real life on the radio like this. If you ever listen to any of my air traffic control versus pilots, you would know that. If you want to see an air traffic control versus pilots, check out this video here and you can watch the pilots get into actual disagreements with air traffic control. And if you want to see me roasting someone besides Hollywood, check out this video up here. I look forward to hearing from you. Until then, keep the blue side up.